Shepard leaned forward and said in a low, furious voice, Put that Bible up, Rufus, and eat your dinner. Johnson continued searching for the passage. Put that Bible up, Shepard shouted. The boy stopped and looked up. His expression was startled but pleased. That book is something for you to hide behind, Shepard said. It's for cowards and people who are afraid to stand on their own feet and figure things out for themselves. Johnson's eyes snapped. He backed his chair a little way from the table. Satan has you in his power, he said. Not only me, you too. Shepard reached across the table to grab the book, but Johnson snatched it and put it in his lap. Shepard laughed. You don't believe in that book, and you know you don't believe in it. I believe it, Johnson said. You don't know what I believe and what I don't. Shepard shook his head. You don't believe in it. You're too intelligent. I ain't too intelligent, the boy muttered. You don't know anything about me. Even if I didn't believe it, it would still be true. You don't believe it, Shepard said. His face was a taunt. I believe it, Johnson said breathlessly. I'll show you I believe it. He opened the book in his lap and tore out a page of it and thrust it into his mouth. He fixed his eyes on Shepard. His jaws worked furiously and the paper crackled as he chewed it. Stop this, Shepard said in a dry, burnt-out voice. Stop it. The boy raised the Bible and tore out a page with his teeth and began grinding it in his mouth, his eyes burning. Shepard reached across the table and knocked the book out of his hand. Leave the table, he said coldly. Johnson swallowed what was in his mouth. His eyes widened as if a vision of splendor were opening up before him. I've eaten it, he breathed. I've eaten it like Ezekiel, and it was honey to my mouth. Leave this table, Shepard said. His hands were clenched beside his plate. I've eaten it, the boy cried. Wonder transformed his face. I've eaten it like Ezekiel, and I don't want none of your food after it, nor no more ever. Go then, Shepard said softly. Go, go. The boy rose and picked up the Bible and started toward the hall with it. At the door he paused, a small black figure on the threshold of some dark apocalypse. The devil has you in his power, he said in a jubilant voice, and disappeared. The lame shall enter first. Welcome or welcome back to Professing Literature, coming to you uh, from Oklahoma City in the summer of 2023, the year of grace. Professing Literature is the podcast where we look closely at short passages of important works of literature in the hopes of seeing writers in action. We aim to work across literary genres and modes, whether comedy or tragedy, drama, poetry or fiction, looking at the dynamics of a passage in order to understand what the author is doing and what is at stake for the work as a whole, the issues that it clarifies, the techniques that are involved. I am David Anderson. I'm a professor of Renaissance literature at the University of Oklahoma in the Department of Classics and Letters. And I am joined by my producer, Mr. Eric Williams. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, David. Hello, hello. Um, it's good to be with you. Um, how's the summer going for you? It is, it's been a, it's been a good summer. Yeah. Um, we moved. Yes. Yeah, um, that's right. So that, that's always a, a, a fun, a fun thing. Well, to, I to... admire your spirit. <laughs> 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 that's, uh, that's not how I tend to think of moving, but, um, good for you. Um, for seeing it otherwise um so all installed the dust settled boxes unpacked yes yeah we're we're yeah everybody settled in the kids kids love it um and uh so yeah we moved out to the country oh that's fantastic so one of my daughters is very scared of all kinds of bugs yeah so we're, we're you know we still have some obstacles to overcome but yeah it yeah it's been good. How about you? Uh, we're doing well. Um, yeah. Um, uh, kids are bouncing off the walls. Um, 
uh, happy that they have a big yard they can play in where we live. Um, my oldest son is fascinated by bugs. He loves them and tries to collect them. Um, and in doing so subjects them to horrible tortures. Um, he's not aware of doing that, but, uh, Ah. you know, he's, he's trying to collect these bugs and give them a little place to live. And I just think, oh, if you really love them, you'd leave them alone. Yeah. Yeah. Just leave them where they are. (laughs) But, uh, um, that's all right. It's his backyard. They're just coming through. So, so, uh, they can watch out, but, um, I've never, um, until I moved to Oklahoma 14 years ago, I'd never lived anywhere where there were actual venomous, creepy crawlies. Um, and I've never, I th- I've seen a tarantula or two on the sidewalk in Oklahoma. I've never seen uh-huh. anything worse than that. I've never seen a cotton mouth or a rattlesnake. And um, that's, uh, th- that's a side of things that, uh, you know, I don't think the average backyard in Oklahoma city is teeming with that sort of thing, but right. it, it does, uh, make me wonder once well, in a while. In our backyard now, yeah, we do have to worry about that. It's the, uh, like we've had a couple of scorpions in yeah. the house. Um, and th- those are creepy yeah. looking. They're, they're utterly repulsive. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, they yeah. look evil and I think it's because they are fundamentally yes, evil. Yes, I, I've there's... never seen a scorpion that wasn't at the zoo and I'm okay with that, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think from what I understand, Oklahoma scorpions compared to those in other places are not too big, um, yeah. a threat, yeah. but yeah, but, but it's, it's just that. And then as far as snakes go, it's like you've got to teach the girl because most like snake bites happen when people are just out walking yeah. and accidentally they don't yep. see it. Yep. You know, they step on it's it. The, tr- the twigs and the leaves and it and it bites. So, yeah, and that's. Yeah. Yeah. These are the things that keep a parent up at night. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, cause uh, cause a little worry if you allow your mind to wander in that direction. But yeah. Um, yeah, uh, we don't have polar bears in Oklahoma or uh, um, uh, Bengal tigers or anything like that. Right. So, right. Um, it's yeah, so it not too worse. much to worry about. Yeah. I guess these things even out. Yeah. Um, but um, indeed. Yeah. Well, um, I don't think either of us expected to go down that road at the beginning of a podcast, <laughs> but there you are. Um, get in touch if you have anecdotes about um, Oklahoma fauna. <laughs> um, and your run-ins with it. Yeah. Please, uh, before I forget, allow me to um, implore you to subscribe to the podcast on your service of choice and to rate us and review us. It all helps. We would be delighted to hear from you. I've cleaned out most of the email backlog and, and written replies in some cases to people um, who uh, deserved a speedier reply than I gave it. But We love to get your email, and I will certainly get in touch if you email. Uh, So please do that. We are professing literature at protonmail.com. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, do do give us um, a bell if you'd like, um, and very happy to take episode suggestions. Um, And once or twice, I think, I followed up on those episode suggestions. I think our Jane Eyre episode came after a couple of people had beat that drum and uh, can't always follow through on them because it's sometimes I I, I might oftentimes agree that a given book would make for a great episode, but I don't necessarily see a way into the book that would work, which doesn't mean it, it couldn't. It's just that I don't see it, but I'm really happy to have the suggestions anyway. But today we are uh, in a, the world of suburban Georgia in the middle of the 20th century with our story. We're talking about a short story, I think, for the first time in the podcast. And uh, it's by maybe my favorite American writer, Flannery O'Connor. And it's her short story, The Lame Shall Enter First. O'Connor was uh, an American writer of the mid 20th century. She is, I think, on just about anybody's list when it comes to the titans of American literature. Her career was cut off tragically, just as she was really hitting her stride. She died um, at the end of her 30s of lupus, lupus that had haunted her for much of her adult life. She was from the state of Georgia and uh, eventually came home to Georgia, where she died. And her fiction is fascinating. It's rich, 
It's beautifully crafted. It's probing and insightful. It's often very funny, and it's incredibly dark. But from O'Connor's point of view, it's dark in the service of light, not dark for its own sake. O'Connor was a devout Catholic for her whole life. And that's striking because, of course, she comes from the heart of the Bible Belt, from the culture of evangelical Protestantism, a culture that she had some affinity for and respect for, although Flannery O'Connor isn't um, famous for showing respect to really anyone, at least in the pages of her fiction. So religion is always at the center of O'Connor's concerns. And if you've hung with us through the last couple of years that we've been doing the podcast, you'll know that religion in literature is something that always interests me and that I take seriously. So O'Connor um, is a devout Catholic who isn't preaching Catholicism in her stories exactly, but does understand the world and the situations in which she puts her characters from a deeply religious point of view, which is not to say that they end with people going to church and getting converted or with people reading their Bibles and deciding to change their lives, but that the, the things she is telling us fundamentally have to do with the idea that humankind is desperate for God and is desperately running away from God. So we, of course, live in a culture of secular humanism. And fundamentally, our culture at the kind of macro level, I'm not talking about everyone who inhabits our culture, but at the macro level, it takes for granted that people are basically good and that the human being is at the center of the universe. Or you might say that the universe has no center. And so we quite naturally put human beings at the center because that's what we would tend to do self-interestedly. And in comparison, O'Connor's perspective seems almost medieval. Human beings are sinful. Human beings are in the business of destroying themselves, of undermining their own happiness, and of making themselves animals. And their only hope is a revelation of God's grace which because of our sinfulness and our spitefulness and our self-harming tendencies has to be violent and painful. That's how she sees things. Only violent, painful, shocking grace can penetrate the complacency that we foster, confronting us with the truth of our own sinfulness and our need of God. And so, O'Connor's stories almost invariably work on that principle that we see characters in action, we inhabit their minds along with them, we see how their own aims are foiled by their hateful, selfish, prideful, slothful tendencies, and then we have a conclusion which is usually shocking, or it's always shocking, often it's shocking because of an act of terrible violence, physical violence. Sometimes the violence is more mental and conceptual, but nevertheless shattering. So, from one perspective, O'Connor seems to have an extremely low opinion of her fellow man. Because of that, she has paradoxically a sympathy with those among her fellow men and women who are generally deplored by the rest of the world. It's not that she is always showing us how wonderful and sweet reprobates, deviants, criminals, madmen, vagabonds are, but that she understands that people from that corner of reality maybe have a little more insight into and access to the truth of things than those of us who live with King Lear in the comfortable, plush world of the castle that I was talking about in our last episode. And so she has a kind of respect for the insight and awareness that people from the margins can have, even as those people from the margins in her story aren't necessarily admirable. They nevertheless have a kind of realism and understanding that those of us who batten on high-calorie diets in comfortable surroundings, driving nice cars, living even if we're lower middle class, in a style that our ancestors couldn't have imagined, 
O'Connor thinks that those perks of civilization anesthetize us to our profound need of divine intervention. The most important issue for her is, to put it bluntly and in simple traditional religious language, how is a fallen human being to be saved? Um, and so she described her writing as concerned with the action of grace in territory held largely by the devil. And she knew very well, as she wrote those words, that she was writing in a, them in a context where most people would roll their eyes at the idea of the devil. And it's not like the guy in red pajamas turns up in O'Connor's story directly and pokes people with his pitchfork. But the idea of the devil is one she takes very seriously, and one that she believes we all need saving from. And so the territory we inhabit, again, to um, flesh out what she says a little more, is enemy-occupied territory. We are prisoners of dark power, and we are, for the most part, willing prisoners, if not accomplices, of that power. And so an invading army is um, at work disrupting that power, but um, it's going to be messy. The appearance of the good in her novels, of the good, the true, and the beautiful, is never easy and sweet, but rather shocking. This is how God gets the attention of a sinner. And so there's always violence of one kind or another. If you know her fiction, and she's had a resurgence of popularity in the last couple of decades, so I'm sure some of you will, um, if you know her fiction, you'll know about stories uh, that end with someone being shot, with someone having a heart attack, uh, with someone discovering that they have a terrible illness. In one case, one very florid example with an old woman getting gored to death by a bull. Um, if you don't know that one, that's the story Greenleaf, um, and I commend it to you. So this is the way um, her fiction tends to work, and that is certainly true of this story. I'm not going to deal with the ending of this story, The Lame Shall Enter First. It's her longest short story. It comes from her second collection. She wrote two collections of short stories before she died, as well as two novels. And her second collection, Everything That Rises Must Converge, is where this story, The Lame Shall Enter First, comes from. It's her longest story, as I say. It's very rich and meaty and interesting, and it's got an absolutely harrowing ending. And uh, I'm not going to spoil the ending. It's partly because I'm not brave enough to go there, because the end of the story is, is so dismal and sad, and it hits closest to home. O'Connor, as a writer, I think when we, when we focus on our main passage, this will quickly become apparent. She's a writer who never wastes a word. She is a consummate craftsman, craftswoman, who is always doing something with a purpose and is never just filling up the page or letting her mind wander through her pen. The thematic fiber of her stories is thick and strong, and she presses the central concerns of the story on us unrelentingly, so that there's hardly a sentence that goes by that you can't stop and focus on and dig into. There are interlocked details in these stories that are, that are just so dense that it's uh, someone like me could, could spend days on them. In one way, she's not a subtle writer. Some writers are subtle. Some writers are not subtle. Jane Austen is a subtle writer. Charles Dickens is not a subtle writer. Doesn't mean Dickens is not a literary genius, and it doesn't mean that Dickens can't do certain things with great subtlety in terms of his construction. But if you know Dickens, you know he likes to hit you over the head with things um, and kind of smile at you as he does so. And O'Connor is at least that unsubtle. And so what I mean by that is that we will see she is hammering certain ideas in the passage I'm going to read, especially having to do with ideas of home and ideas of food that go all the way through the 40 pages of this story and are maintained throughout. And so she is telling us, do you get the point? Do you get the point? Do you get the point? Over and over and over again. So with The Lame Shall Enter First, we have a really interesting example of her program. Oftentimes, well, um, 
Eric and I were talking to a friend a little while ago, and I said, when we were discussing the topic of this episode, I said something about how no one is safe for her. It's not as though there are certain kind of people out there or people with a certain kind of politics or indeed religion who are safe from O'Connor's harsh treatment. Um, she sees all of us in this world as self-deluding and profoundly needful. All of us in our various ways have to be shaken out of our casual, self-soothing set of ideas about how good we are and how right on our ideas are. And so sometimes the sort of victim hero in a story of O'Connor's will be a nasty bigot. Sometimes it will be a kind of, quote, good person, someone who thinks of themselves as the right kind of people, you know, very moral and upstanding. That's a little bit of what we have here in this one. Sometimes it's people who are jaded and nihilistic and who think they've seen through all the nonsense and have, have a kind of gimlet eye on the world and know better than all the other poor slobs. Well, all of us are poor slobs from O'Connor's point of view. And the protagonist of this story, The Lame Shall Enter First, is an interesting one because he represents, well, he is a liberal. He's a do-gooding, high-minded liberal. A man who we would probably be happy enough to have as a next-door neighbor, especially if we didn't get to know him very well. The sort of man that most of us would probably, in a lot of ways, prefer to resemble, especially when you compare him with some of the other characters in O'Connor's works. But she is going to dissect his mind and his life, um, and the results won't be pretty. So in this story, I'll say off the top, we have three principal characters. We have a man named Shepard. We don't know his first name. We only know him as Shepard. He's an adult, and he is the high-minded do-gooder that I was talking about. He is a father of a single child. He works in a boy's reformatory, and so he has a kind of crusading zeal to make the world a better place and to help. And he's doing something which is obviously very important. He's dealing with delinquent kids and trying to make their lives better. Um, and I don't think O'Connor thinks there's necessarily anything wrong with that. But the things that motivate Shepard, she thinks, are very wrong. And Shepard is also, um, you could think of him as, to use an old term, as a positivist. He's someone who believes in this kind of 19th century progressive way that human reason and human morality can solve the world's problems, that science and technology can lead us to a brighter future, and that we have to blow out the old cobwebs of past ideas if we want to move forward. And that, you know, he has a sort of simplistic idea of ever greater enlightenment that will eventually lead humanity to happiness and that if we can get some of our old assumptions out of the way, then the world will be a better place. And Shepard, as he's scripting this story in his head, sees himself as a potential hero in it. So that's Shepard. The next character of the three is his son, Norton. Norton is 10 years old. He's not very bright, so we're told. We don't really have a chance to know better. He is soft and emotionally fragile. There's not very much in his life. His main preoccupation and his main interest involves money. And so Norton does what kids in the mid-20th century would sometimes do to earn some pocket money, which is to sell seeds door to door. And he seems to be pretty good at this. And so we know, we hear about how he takes the nickels and dimes he gets selling seeds and he hoards them in jars and he takes them out, uh, takes the money out and counts it and he counts his seed packets. And uh, that's Norton. Finally, the third character is a homeless boy whom Shepard came across through his work named Rufus Johnson, a street kid, a bitterly angry young man. Rufus Johnson, we are told, was raised by an abusive fire and brimstone grandfather, a grandfather who was way out on the ledge with some of his apocalyptic Christianity, 
and he is clearly a savage, evil-hearted old man who was um, abusive to his grandson, but for whom his grandson nevertheless maintains a kind of respect. Rufus Johnson, if he's angry, probably because of this upbringing, he's also angry because he was born with a club foot. And this was at a time and place where what I understand now to be the fairly routine surgery that can correct a club foot was not available to him. So he has this deformity in the form of a foot that doesn't work properly and that is swollen up and that he kind of has to drag behind him. And so the lame in the title obviously refers directly um, or most um, overtly to Rufus. Um, he quotes the old phrase from the spiritual fathers, I think, that the lame shall enter first. It's not a biblical phrase, but it's a kind of Christian idea that those who in this world are downtrodden and who are kind of misfits in the next world will have pride of place. But Johnson is a young man who's filled with anger. He, on the one hand, has a kind of deep, strange faith, but at the other, he's a figure of destruction. So although he has this faith, that does not mean we are to see him straightforwardly as the kind of good character whom we're to learn from any more than we were to see King Lear after his night on the heath as a good character whom we can learn from. It's, it's more difficult than that. And the process of understanding Rufus Johnson and what he's telling Shepard and the rest of us is, you know, a, a, a few big grains of salt are required in that. Johnson is highly intelligent. He gets IQ tested at the reformatory, and Shepard is shocked to discover that he has an IQ of 140, which I think is on the bottom edge of sort of genius territory. And so this makes him fascinating to Shepard. He sees Johnson as someone he can reform and inspire, and someone who will no doubt be forever grateful to him that this, this kindly mentor has seen his gifts and his capacity and is going to help him. Johnson doesn't see it quite that way. So he's a compelling and dangerous character. He believes in this Bible that Shepard knocks out of his hand in the passage that we began with, um, but he also believes that he is reprobate, probably, in going to hell. And so he's a sort of diabolical figure, even though he's also, from O'Connor's perspective, telling Shepard certain truths. Johnson, maybe we could understand as having a kind of ability, a sort of negative ability to advance O'Connor's ideas. That is, he can do the work of destroying certain bad ideas, or at least push in that direction, uh, but he's not building anything. The, the sort of motivating action of the story that we hear about in the passage we'll look at shortly is Shepard's decision to invite Johnson to live with him, to invite him into his home. This is, we will see, a questionable decision made on questionable premises with absolutely destructive results. He wants to change this boy's life, but we quickly see that this maybe has to do more with Shepard's own self-image of himself as a good person rather than for actual care for the boy. A literary antecedent to Shepard would have to be one of Dickens' great minor characters from his tremendous novel Bleak House. Um, if anyone knows that novel, you may remember she only appears in a handful of chapters, but Mrs. Jellybee comes to mind when I think of Rufus Johnson. Uh, Dickens refers to Mrs. Jellybee as, a, as he calls her a, quote, telescopic philanthropist. Telescopic philanthropist. What does that mean? Well, Mrs. Jellybee... Um, has the vocation, she's decided she has the vocation of raising money for a missionary effort in Central Africa, where she's going to raise the status of the natives, raise them up morally and also financially. And so she's become sort of famous for her philanthropical efforts in England because she's made quite a name for herself and for this cause. And so a lot of important people have a very high opinion of Mrs. Jellybee. But she is a telescopic philanthropist, and think what that means. That means she's looking through the telescope to something that's in the far distance, 
She's looking at it closely. That's what she's concerned with. But the whole world around her is, is black to her. Um, she's only looking through her telescope at this problem far away. It's not that we don't need people to be concerned with faraway problems, but if that comes at the cost of noticing the problems that are going on all around you, that's not good. Certainly Dickens doesn't think it's good. And so when we visit Mrs. Jellybee's home, this woman who is so admired by so many people and is so successful, we find a house that's falling apart and a family that's not cared for, including young children. Um, it's not that she's mean to them, it's that she doesn't notice them, and that when she does notice them, she's mildly annoyed that they would think that their concerns should interrupt her, because don't you know how important this work is that I'm doing? And so someone who does this is in the position to give themselves very high-minded consolations for being distracted from or ignoring the gaping wounds that are all around them. Um, she's doing good work. She's doing God's work. Or in Shepard's case, he's doing the work of progress and of science and making a better future. And so the rest of the world, including the people at his very feet, need to just cheer him on and get with his program. So I decided we would read today the introductory paragraphs from this book. This is something I like doing when I teach sometimes, when I teach a work of fiction, is to look closely at the first page or two. Um, I think this is how we approached Orwell uh, 1984, back a couple of summers ago, was to do it this way. And so we're going to look at the opening of the novel, which has the advantage of, you know, you don't need a whole lot of background detail for us to do that. And then I'll maybe make reference towards the end to the passage that I began with, which comes from later in the novel when Shepard and Johnson are sitting at the dinner table. But here we'll go. I'll read this opening passage. The lame shall enter first. Shepard sat on a stool at the bar that divided the kitchen in half, eating his cereal out of the individual pasteboard box it came in. He ate mechanically, his eyes on the child who was wandering from cabinet to cabinet in the paneled kitchen, collecting the ingredients for his breakfast. He was a stocky blonde boy of ten. Shepard kept his intense blue eyes fixed on him. The boy's future was written in his face. He would be a banker. No, worse. He would operate a small loan company. All he wanted for the child was that he be good and unselfish, and neither seemed likely. Shepard was a young man whose hair was already white. It stood up like a narrow brush halo over his pink, sensitive face. The boy approached the bar with the jar of peanut butter under his arm, a plate with a quarter of a small chocolate cake on it in one hand, and the ketchup bottle in the other. He did not appear to notice his father. He climbed up on the stool and began to spread peanut butter on the cake. He had very large, round ears that leaned away from his head and seemed to pull his eyes slightly too far apart. His shirt was green, but so faded that the cowboy charging across the front of it was only a shadow. Norton, Shepard said, I saw Rufus Johnson yesterday. Do you know what he was doing? The child looked at him with a kind of half-attention, his eyes forward but not yet engaged. They were a paler blue than his father's, as if they might have faded like the shirt. One of them listed almost imperceptibly toward the outer rim. He was in an alley, Shepard said, and he had his hand in a garbage can. He was trying to get something to eat out of it. He paused to let this soak in. He was hungry, he finished, and tried to pierce the child's conscience with his gaze. The boy picked up the piece of chocolate cake and began to gnaw it from one corner. Norton, Shepard said, do you have any idea what it means to share? A flicker of attention. Some of it's yours, Norton said. Some of it's his, Shepard said heavily. It was hopeless. Almost any fault would have been preferable to selfishness, a violent temper, even a tendency to lie. The child turned the bottle of ketchup upside down and began thumping ketchup onto the cake. Shepard's look of pain increased. 
"'You are ten and Rufus Johnson is fourteen, he said. "'Yet I'm sure your shirts would fit Rufus.' Rufus Johnson was a boy he had been trying to help at the reformatory for the past year. He had been released two months ago. When he was in the reformatory, he looked pretty good, but when I saw him yesterday, he was skin and bones. He hasn't been eating cake with peanut butter on it for breakfast. The child paused. It's stale, he said. That's why I have to put stuff on it. Shepard turned his face to the window at the end of the bar. The side lawn, green and even, sloped fifty feet or so down to a small suburban wood. When his wife was living, they had often eaten outside, even breakfast on the grass. He had never noticed then that the child was selfish. Listen to me, he said, turning back to him. Look at me and listen. The boy looked at him. At least his eyes were forward. I gave Rufus a key to this house when he left the reformatory to show my confidence in him so that he would have a place he could come to and feel welcome at any time. He didn't use it, but I think he'll use it now because he's seen me and he's hungry. And if he doesn't use it, I'm going out to find him and bring him here. I can't see a child eating out of garbage cans. The boy frowned. It was dawning on him that something of his was threatened. Shepard's mouth stretched in disgust. Rufus's father died before he was born, he said. His mother is in the state penitentiary. He was raised by his grandfather in a shack without water or electricity, and the old man beat him every day. How would you like to belong to a family like that? I don't know, the child said lamely. Well, you might think about it sometime, Shepard said. And that's where we'll end for now. So I'm going to work through this almost line by line. Uh, you've seen me do this before, and uh, you've heard me do this before, and we'll try to get a sense of what's going on here. I am, as usual, very much aware of the fact that um, unless you happen by luck to read this recently, you don't have the story in your mind. So I'll do what I can to explicate this particular passage in a way that makes clear the broad arc of the story as a whole without, without hopefully getting bogged down in plot summary. And we'll see how that goes. Just to tell you briefly, Johnson will come to Shepard's home. Norton will feel very threatened by this. Johnson is very difficult. Um, he's a little bit rough on Norton, but also a little bit friendly to Norton in a way that Shepard doesn't quite understand. But he's very hostile to Shepard. Shepard will try to do things for Johnson that he thinks will make his life better. He buys him a telescope and a microscope because he wants Johnson to use this glorious IQ of his to explore the scientific world. He's very vexed at the fact that Johnson is still holding tightly to his Bible and has a sense that he needs to use his intelligence for other things. Johnson will commit petty crimes in the neighborhood and will lie about them and will get Shepard into trouble because of this. Shepard attempts, or Shepard has Johnson fitted for a special orthopedic shoe, which is apparently supposed to mitigate the limp uh, that comes from his club foot, but Johnson will hate the shoe and reject it and want nothing to do with it, which is a very heavy-handed, I think, example of how Shepard tries to heal Johnson in a way that is without understanding and is unwelcome to him. And then the story ends, as I suggested earlier, with a very shocking, violent final scene that I won't detail. So those are the broad strokes of the story. And now we'll walk through this passage that I've singled out. So we begin with the word shepherd, the name of this man. And when I say O'Connor is not a subtle writer, again, I'm not saying that she isn't a brilliant writer and that she's not capable of different kinds of subtlety but she has no problem at any point with hitting us in the face with a frying pan. And the name Shepherd is going to do that, because of course we know what a shepherd is in a general sense, and we also know the connotations that the word shepherd is supposed to have. Of course, the Latin word shepherd is pastor, and so the pastor of the church is the shepherd of the church in this biblical traditional sense, which sees the people as a flock of sheep and the leader of the people as their shepherd. And of course, the New Testament talks about good shepherds and bad shepherds. 
Well, Shepherd, the man, aspires to be a shepherd, a leader of the flock, although not in a theological sense. He wants to be the leader and the caretaker of Johnson, but his qualifications as a shepherd will be quickly thrown into doubt. So Shepherd, we hear, sat on a stool at the bar. And that first phrase, we haven't even come to our first full clause yet. And that already might get us thinking certain things. If you just take a sort of reader response angle on the passage and you're rolling along half a line into the text, Shepherd sat on a stool at the bar. Well, we're picturing, what, a seedy dive bar or something like that, or a plush bar. We're imagining the man's going to be nursing a martini something like that. Of course, our eyes move too quickly for us to really formulate that image, but that's the kind of thing we imagine when we hear sat on a stool at a bar. O'Connor knows this, but that's not where she's going. The full, sen- the full clause is, Shepherd sat on a stool at the bar that divided the kitchen in half. What do we have here? We have a kind of mid-20th century home. This is not how kitchens were set up in the 19th and early 20th century, and it's not how homes were set up. Now we are quite familiar with the idea of a kitchen having a kind of countertop bar at which people can sit and eat a meal. And I must say, there's nothing wrong with them. My wife and I were talking about putting something like that in our own kitchen. That might work for our house. I am not impugning you if you eat your meals sometimes at a countertop bar on those high stools, that's just fine. But O'Connor doesn't waste details like this and already is asking us to do some thinking. Shepard is sitting on his stool at the bar that divided the kitchen in half, eating his cereal out of the individual pasteboard box it came in. Once again, I have memories of, you know, my uh, mother would um, be very careful when it came to things like cereal, and we were never allowed to have the fun stuff, only uh, the boring, healthy cereal. But every once in a while, uh, we'd get a shot at some Cap'n Crunch or something like that. And I used to love, if we were camping, to get those little individual boxes of, of cereal, the, su- the more sugary the better, where you would cut them open and slit the wax paper with a pair of scissors and then pour your milk right in the box and and eat your sugary cereal. I thought that was the coolest thing. Eric is nodding along, so um, we're of the same generation. He gets this too. Again, if you sometimes do this in your family, um, I'm not impugning you. But all of this, this first sentence, is already raising questions about food and family and home. And the way that O'Connor is arranging these details is not about denouncing people who have countertop bars in their kitchen or who eat cereal out of those little boxes. What's going on here is she's beginning to hold up details that tell us about the kind of home this is and ask questions about it. Look how we're told that the bar divided the kitchen in half. Again, architecturally, I don't have a problem with that, but That language of division is important. And the idea that we're sitting and we're having this opening scene that is a meal at what is described as a bar rather than a table is a problem. And the fact that Shepard is eating what he is eating is a problem. Again, not in and of itself. I don't think O'Connor is trying to tell you that two fried eggs and a couple of sausage links are absolutely what you should be eating every morning at breakfast and never touch cereal. But we have here a view of a kind of modern family home, architecturally, and a modern family meal in terms of the food, and things are not as they should be. It's not that you couldn't take these details of the countertop bar and the cereal and make a perfectly wholesome and healthy family scene out of them, but it's that in this story we're already being given the sense that things don't work properly and that priorities are not good. Shepard is sitting by himself at this bar, eating this meal, which suggests, you know, he's not putting the cereal in a bowl, 
He's just dumping the milk on the cereal. We hear in the next line that he ate mechanically, and perhaps that's apt for food that is mechanically produced, mass-produced, food that, of course, we know all too well at this stage in history that is almost valueless for us in terms of nutritional content, although in the 50s they could sort of kid themselves that this kind of food was the food of the future. So he's eating this meal which is not a proper meal, and he's doing it in a way that is not proper. Again, life is messy, life is busy, sometimes we have to eat like this and take food like this, but we're going to see that rather than being a kind of exception to Shepard's life, this is telling us home truths about Shepard's life and his personality. His food is mere input, and eating it mechanically, he's not thinking about it, and he's not recognizing that as food it is valueless. Food is incredibly important, not just to our physical bodies, but to our whole understanding of ourselves as persons in the world. Food always, immemorially, has demanded a certain level of ceremony from us. And sometimes we may have to neglect that ceremony, but I think our personal flourishing suggests that we shouldn't neglect it too much too often. You should not be content to just open up a can of beans and stand by the sink, shoving them down. There's, even when we're eating alone, a certain ceremony that is entailed in laying a place at a table and sitting down and using a knife and fork, reminding ourselves that we're human, not animals, and not robots, and having, even if it's only with a very light, distant touch, a sense of ceremony because food connects us to the world and connects us to one another. And the connections in this house are broken. And we see that almost immediately. Because Shepherd, while he is eating, we are told, he's eating mechanically, and it says his eyes on the child, not his eyes on his son or his eyes on Norton, but his eyes on the child. And so we don't even yet know who this child is, but we already have a feeling of shepherd's distance from this child. The shepherd is distant from one of his lambs. What is the child doing? Well, we're told he's wandering from cabinet to cabinet in the paneled kitchen, collecting ingredients for his breakfast. So we have a man who sat himself down at the bar, the bar that divides him, that divides the kitchen, and also, by implication, divides him from his son, who's in the kitchen. And he's eating his own box of cereal, not concerned with it, and also not concerned to make breakfast for his son. How different this would be if they were both sitting side by side eating their boxes of cereal. But that's not what we have here. Shepherd has taken care of himself and his own needs for sustenance with indifference to the actual content of that food and to the fact that his son needs sustenance also. His son, who at this point we don't even understand yet as son, but who is only the child. The child who has to wander while he gets his own breakfast together. And that phrase, wandering, is striking. Jesus, at one point in the Gospels, has compassion for the people, we are told, whom he saw as being sheep without a shepherd. And this little boy is in that position. He is a sheep, and he does not have a shepherd. And so, as his father sits there chewing his own worthless breakfast, the child has to find his own breakfast, and the father regards him with judgment, we will see, and with detachment. Shepherd is staring at this child, and it's clear that he's staring at him with mild distaste, distaste that he probably disguises far less effectively to the boy than he might like to think he does. He looks at the boy, and already half a paragraph into this story, he is judging him this boy who has to figure out his own breakfast. It's not that a boy of ten can't get his own breakfast together, but there's something off-putting about a father who sits down and deals with his own breakfast while his ten-year-old has to, quote, wander to put his together. As he looks at the boy, 
Shepard decides that his future was written in his face. So he sees this child, and already he decides, sees what this child is and what he will be, and he doesn't like it. Shepard thinks that this boy will be a money man, a low-level money man, a banker or an operator of a loan company. And then we hear a statement that is very high-minded, but that we should already be suspicious of because of the details we've been given so far. Shepard decides, and you know, I should say I'll pause here. Um, O'Connor, like other writers, the most famous of whom is probably Jane Austen, O'Connor is a master of what's known as free indirect discourse or free indirect speech. And that's a kind of prose writing where you don't have... O'Connor will, will give sometimes, oftentimes, dialogue. In other words, she will write out what a character is saying, and we recognize that from the quotation marks that surround the statement, and then usually a phrase like, he said, or she asked, or something like that. That's dialogue. Free indirect discourse is when the narrator gives us a picture of what the character is thinking, but they do so in the sort of voice of that character and with the implicit foibles and perspective of that character. So it's not that we're hearing that character actually say a line, and it's also not that we are having just a kind of flat description of exactly what they're thinking. It's when there's a kind of voicing by the narrator of what they're thinking in the style in which they would say it. Jane Austen is the great artist of this. She will give us a paragraph where there is no dialogue, but where we're hearing something voiced in the way that Miss, Mrs. Bennet or Mr. Woodhouse or Sir, Sir, uh, is it Sir Thomas Eliot in Persuasion, I can't remember, the way in which they would say it and the values that would motivate them. And so we have that here with Shepard. All um, the boy would be the operator of a small loan company. That's what Shepard is thinking, and that's the way in which he would think it. And he does so disparagingly. And then we hear that all he wanted was for the ch for the child was that he be good and unselfish, and neither seemed likely. All he wanted for the child was that he be good and unselfish and neither seemed likely. Now, on the one hand, I think it is a very good thing for a parent to want moral goodness to be at the center of their child's life. All he wanted is troubling, though, because parents are supposed to want more for their children than simply their moral perfection, even if they are supposed to recognize that that moral perfection is key to the child's happiness as well as his ethical track record. All Shepard wants for Norton is a strong, if quiet, phrase was that he be good and unselfish and neither seemed likely. In this sentence, we have both his writing off of the child as likely to fail in these priorities and the priorities themselves. So there's strong antipathy here already. Shepard sees Norton as a lost cause and as something of a brute. Norton cares about money. And we'll hear about this later in the story. Shepard hates the way Norton sits on the carpet counting his pennies and nickels and dimes all day. Now, already we might be primed to ask, why does Norton care about money? And I don't think we would be wrong if we hypothesized that there's a certain insecurity in this boy's life that's already coming clear. Because Look at the way this family meal is happening, and look at the judgmental insensitivity and unsympathetic way in which his father is regarding him. So Norton's attachment to money may be more explicable and sympathetic than at first we might assume. Finally, the paragraph ends with a little bit of description, and O'Connor can just be so flat and straightforward sometimes in the way she says things. She says, Shepard was a young man whose hair was already white. It stood up like a narrow brush halo over his pink, sensitive face. So he's a young father still, a young man, 
His hair is white. I'm going to come back to that in a little while. But we're told his hair resembles a kind of halo. Shepard sees himself as, as a kind of secular saint. But his, and his sanctity is going to be called into question. But he has right now this sort of halo around himself, or at least an apparent halo. The next paragraph begins with its focus on Norton. We are watching Norton once again through the father's eyes. We're told he approached the bar, so this bar is still dividing him from his father. And what does he have? If I'm critical of Shepard's breakfast, we also have to be pretty critical of Norton's, because Norton seems to be eating even worse than Shepard does. He has a piece of chocolate cake, a jar of peanut butter, and most repulsively, a bottle of ketchup. We are told in the next sentence, he did not appear to notice his father. Now, it seems fair to say that Norton is a rather dim little boy. He is not IQ 140. He may not even be IQ 100. Who knows? Um, his father certainly undervalues him, so there may be intelligence there that the father isn't taking any trouble to cultivate. But it also seems fair to think that Norton is not very bright, and the fact that he doesn't notice his father fits for Shepard into a wider understanding of his character as sort of vacant and tuned out. We, at this point, again, already, though, may have reason to ask if this is not because his father is not any kind of positive presence in his life. That, from a certain point of view, this child already effectively lives alone. In that the relationship that a father is supposed to have with a child is absent for him. Shepard, in good 1950s style, will go out to work in the mornings, and I think it's the summer holidays, so Norton's not in school, and we will learn, we will learn that when he goes to work, Norton, the 10-year-old, simply has to entertain himself for the day in the house. It's not really what's recommended now. Now we'd think of that as a latchkey kid and be concerned for him. It's not that in the 1950s that may have been the best option you have. And now that I think of it, I think they do have a housekeeper who comes in the middle of the day and is maybe an adult presence in Norton's life. But the boy may as well live alone in that the real meaning of the word home is not cultivated for him. And so, yes, he doesn't notice Shepard. Shepard, of course, um, is going to go off to work a little while later, and Norton will be alone working with his seed packets when he will hear a key in the door, and Rufus Johnson will enter his house. And for Shepard, this is a triumph because it means he's getting somewhere with Johnson. Johnson is going to start trusting him. But for Norton, of course, it's absolutely terrifying, as it would be for a 10-year-old who hears that an older street boy is given the key to the house and may stop by at any moment. And so when that happens, poor Norton goes and hides in the closet until Johnson eventually finds him. And as I said, Johnson isn't exactly mean to him but he's kind of ominous. Norton now climbs up on the stool, and he puts peanut butter on the cake. That's not, you know, some people love that chocolate-peanut butter combination. It's not my favorite, but okay. Not especially appetizing, but you could countenance it. And then we hear a little description of Norton, and it's not a flattering description. O'Connor's not given to flattering descriptions of anyone, even children. And this child is not especially attractive. What do we hear about him? Well, he's kind of goofy looking. He has big ears that stick out, and they seem to pull his eyes too far apart, she says. We'll later hear that um, his eyes, that he has um, what is impolitely referred to as a lazy eye, one of his eyes drifts, which can give a person a look of low intelligence, even if they don't deserve that assumption. So, and Norton is a little bit heavy set, so he's not an attractive child. But remember whose eyes we're looking at him through. We're looking at him through the father's eyes, who even if he could take note of some, you know, some of his 
less splendid physical characteristics should still not be regarding him with this air of judgment, of hostile judgment. Norton's shirt, we're told something about. And again, you know, in another context, a detail like this might mean nothing. A kid might have a very old shirt that he sleeps in, and so the fact that it's faded doesn't matter. Or a kid might be attached to an old shirt. That's fine. If some of your children are wearing faded clothing, I'm not mad at you. That's fine. But in the context of these details that are piling up, it matters when we hear that Norton's shirt is so faded that you can hardly see the picture of the cowboy that's going across it. Whose job is it to ensure that this child has decent clothing? Well, we know it's the shepherd's job. And given what we've already read, we're bothered by the fact that this is what Norton is wearing. Shepherd finally, we, we finally have dialogue as Shepherd addresses his son. And the thing he wants to talk about is not his son, but Rufus Johnson. I saw Rufus Johnson yesterday. Do you know what he was doing? Well, that's a rhetorical question. Of course, the boy doesn't know what this kid was doing. That's obvious. And so there's something officious and luxury already about this conversation. Norton has no way of knowing what Rufus Johnson was doing. He looked at his father with a kind of half attention. Again, that gives us the sense of Norton's low intelligence, which may or may not be fair. It may be half attention because, um, again, he's so distant from his father that he can hardly regard him. Um, we hear that Norton's eyes, in addition to him having a lazy eye, his eyes were paler blue than his father's, as if they might have faded like the shirt. So this is not the, this is the second of three references to Norton's shirt in this page of text. The last one's coming up in a minute. So O'Connor wants us to understand that that faded shirt was not just a throwaway detail she gave us as she was doing a little scene painting. Norton's eyes are faded like the shirt. They're a paler blue than his father's. Norton's spirit is faded. Norton's grip on his own humanity is pretty weak. And if that happens to you when you're 30 years old, that might be your responsibility. But if your spirit is already faded and washed out when you're 10, that's someone else's responsibility. Shepard answers his own question, explaining that Johnson was in an alley and that he was rummaging food out of a garbage can. And he says he was trying to get something to eat out of it. He paused to let this soak in. He was hungry. He finished. And then O'Connor says he tried to pierce the child's conscience with his gaze. So what has the father done as the son is sitting down at the table with uh, the apparatus of his breakfast? He brings up this other boy this other boy who was, and of course it's very sad, was foraging for food in a garbage can, and he tries to pierce the child's conscience with his gaze. Ten-year-olds are capable of feeling deep sympathy over something like that. Shepard is trying to pierce Norton. So it's the language of violence and aggression. Again, in another context, might be nothing wrong with, one, with talking about how one character is trying to pierce the conscience of another. Shepard already has written Norton off as effectively conscienceless, as someone who's destined to become a loan officer. Now he's trying to pierce Norton's conscience, but look at what he's doing it with. He's doing it with hunger, and the fact that Johnson was, as he says, hungry, and is fishing, foraging for food in a trash can. The metaphor of consumption, of what we take into our bodies, runs throughout this story. From the very first line where Shepard is eating his cereal in the pasteboard box, now we hear about how Johnson has been finding sustenance, and Johnson has not been doing a good job. O'Connor doesn't think that just because Shepard and Norton's meal is problematic, Johnson's garbage can meal is therefore better. These are all bad ways of finding sustenance. But of course, the question is, how hungry is Norton? 
And is he much better off than Johnson, if at all? Norton is also hungry, but he's derided by his father. You know, for one thing, he's stocky, he's a little bit overweight, and so what does he have to complain about? He's got a kitchen full of food he can poke around in. But the fact that his son is hungry is something the father rolls his eyes at. Of course, the father regards food only as a kind of caloric input and nothing more. He eats his mechanically produced food mechanically. Norton is hungry too, of course, and Norton's hunger for physical food um, symbolizes other kinds of hunger that we have and other kinds of consumption that we undertake and other kinds of appetites and needs. And so it's no accident that at this point we're told that Norton picks up his cake and began to gnaw it from one corner. And we will see in a little while why he's gnawing it from one corner. It has to do with the cake itself. Shepard isn't noticing this, um, or at least isn't, isn't understanding what it means that his child is eating his cake this way. And he immediately puts the, the issue back on this kind of, uh, it's this telescopic philanthropy. This is his son in front of him, but Shepard is concerned to make sure his son shares his ethical point of view. And he says another rhetorical question, again, in sometimes a good form of teaching, the Socratic questioning, sometimes not, he asks his son, do you have any idea what it means to share? Which is cutting. It's a cutting way to put it. Because, of course, he already believes Norton doesn't really understand what it means to share, and Norton doesn't. Norton doesn't understand very well what it means to share. Shepard thinks this is because he's grasping and greedy. But who's teaching this child? And so Norton says, well, what it means to share is some of it's yours. And Shepard says, no, it means some of it's his and sighs and is exasperated and drops the point. Shepard himself is going to find that sharing in practice, certainly sharing with Rufus Johnson when he invites him into his home, is more difficult than he seems to imagine here. But he's right now disgusted with Norton's failure to get it. And then we have another of these little editorial comments, free and direct discourse, after Shepard is disappointed by Norton's answer. We're told, almost any fault would have been preferable to selfishness, which is Norton's great fault, a violent temper, even a tendency to lie. Well, there are many different kinds of selfishness, and they don't involve always um, jars of coins and chocolate cake. Shepard himself um, has... Uh, a type of selfishness that he's not very well aware of at this point. But look what he contrasts to Norton's selfishness. He thinks it would be better to have almost any other fault, including a violent temper and a tendency to lie. If you read the story, you will see that Shepard will get both of these in plenty very quickly when Rufus Johnson comes home, the violent temper and the tendency to lie. And Shepard won't look back on this moment, but we'll see him struggle with the fact that those two negative attributes aren't exactly a walk in the park. We go back to Norton, and it's here that things get really queasy, because the peanut butter apparently wasn't enough for Norton. He now puts ketchup on his cake. Uh, it's a great image, she says, of him thumping the ketchup bottle and the ketchup onto the cake, and we all know what it's like to... Uh, have a glass ketchup bottle. Shepard's look of pain increased. And we might think, you know, it's an off-putting thing. And we might think the look of pain comes from the fact that ketchup, peanut butter on chocolate cake will please some tastes, although perhaps not all, but ketchup on chocolate cake is simply disgusting. But Shepard is, uh, has a painful look, not because of what he's watching his child do and what his child is about to eat, but for other reasons, because of his telescopic philanthropy. He takes the question back to the comparison between his son and Rufus, and how his son doesn't have his moral priorities. He notes that Rufus Johnson is 14. Johnson is clearly malnourished both before and after he got out of the reformatory. He clearly grew up in poverty. 
He's small and scrawny, and Shepard says, I'm sure your shirts would fit Rufus. So once again, we have attention drawn to the idea of Norton's shirts. And so the fact that that t-shirt is faded is in my mind becoming more and more of a thing that O'Connor is pressing on. Um, that Shepard is now bragging on Norton's behalf about how um, well turned out Norton is in his faded t-shirt. So yes, Norton might be stocky enough that a t-shirt of his could fit Johnson, but Shepard should not be crowing about how well provided for his child is. We hear a little more about Johnson at this point, about how he's a boy that Shepard's been trying to help professionally, um, about how he's now skin and bones because it's been two months since he got out of the reformatory and he hasn't been having his three square a day. And then we get this killer statement. As you know, remember, Norton doesn't know who Rufus Johnson is. It's not Norton's fault that he hasn't given his t-shirts to a boy he doesn't know yet. But now as Shepard castigates his son, he says, he hasn't been eating cake with peanut butter on it for breakfast. So don't you know how lucky you are? In the abstract, a kid is delighted by the idea of cake for breakfast and should not be given it. Shepard assumes that Norton is fortunate to be having cake for breakfast, but we are already starting to recognize that this is not a measure of Norton's good fortune, but a, as a, but a measure of his deprivation and the fact that he has a negligent parent, a parent who is divided from him, a parent who looks at him in a distant, detached way, and who looks at him with judgment who isn't interested in what he has to say, but only in his failure to provide the right answer for his rhetorical questions. So, aren't you lucky to be having cake with peanut butter on it for breakfast? And now we learn something that, jo that Shepard can't be bothered to notice. We're told the child paused. It's stale, he says. That's why I have to put stuff on it. So Norton is dressing up this cake. Remember him gnawing the corner of the cake, which is not the way in which, not the way that one usually describes eating a piece of chocolate cake. This cake is not moist. This cake is dry and stale. And Norton is putting things on it, even disgusting things on it, because it's stale. Now, I'm not saying this was the only thing in the house he couldn't have eaten. I'm not saying that he couldn't have had a box of cereal like Shepard did. Presumably, Shepard would not begrudge him having a box of cereal, although O'Connor has already deflated the idea that that's a kind of wholesome breakfast. She knows better. But Norton is putting stuff on his cake because his cake is stale and because his parent is not saying, let me make you a piece of toast with some jam on it and then you can have a banana and a glass of milk. Instead, Shepard is listlessly judgmentally watching his child rummage around for unwholesome food that has already gone off, that he has to dress up with stuff. And while he is doing this, his father is comparing his supposedly privileged situation with that of Johnson. You can see already that I don't like Shepard very much, um, although I will admit um, I have to feel some sympathy for him. When Norton says it's stale, his father should say, oh, good night, son. I thought you were having a treat, um, but I'm not going to let you eat stale cake for breakfast. What can we do? But instead, we're immediately told Shepard turned his face to the window. So he turns away from Norton at this moment rather than coming closer to him and saying, how can I help you get a better breakfast? He looks away at this point. And that's a telling detail. He looks away because he can't face the truth that he is not providing properly for his child. The surface level narrative he has is that his child doesn't care about what matters and that it's kind of hopeless. And so all he can do is hector him. But the truth is Norton is uncared for. And Shepard doesn't want to face that truth. And so he turns away and thoughts follow that the narrator gives us access to, which hammer this home. He turns away and looks outside. What does he see? He sees the green lawn. 
Now, maybe that's connecting us to Norton's faded green t-shirt. I don't know. But we'll hear more about how they live on a nice little piece of property in their suburban neighborhood in, I guess, presumably Atlanta. And there's some other O'Connor stories set in and around Atlanta. I don't know if that's uh, what she's uh, wanting us to think of, but it's a suburban piece of property on a little bit of land with a little bit of forest at the bottom of the lawn. And then we're told something which I find devastating. When his wife was living, they had often eaten outside, even breakfast on the grass. He had never noticed then that the child was selfish. I'll read that again. When his wife was living, they had often eaten outside, even breakfast on the grass. He had never noticed then that the child was selfish. We are now told that Shepard is a widower, which means that Norton is without his mother. And we are told, without any editorializing on the part of the narrator, but just told flatly that when the mother was alive, things were different. How were they different? Well, there were family meals. There were picnics outside, even breakfast. That may, re that may suggest that the late Mrs. Shepard had a kind of whimsical attitude to life, but that would certainly be the kind of attitude to life that a child would appreciate, where even breakfast is something we can eat on the grass on a blanket. We don't do that anymore. Shepard sees food and meals and home in purely functional terms, as a matter of material circumstances, and it wouldn't occur to him to make a picnic with his son. This is because of Shepard's priorities and because of the way in which he problematically regards his home, but O'Connor is also telling us, without saying it, that there is trauma here. And now, I said earlier I would come back to Shepard's white hair the end of the first paragraph of the story. We're told Shepard was a young man whose hair was already white. Now, there are people who do the kind of Steve Martin thing, who go gray and white-haired very early in life. That's fine. It's not a big deal. But we also know that people who experience trauma can go white-haired in a very short amount of time. She doesn't say that's what happens with Shepard, but we can wonder. And we can wonder if his telescopic philanthropy and his detachment from his child are products of the fact that he experienced the trauma of losing his young wife. O'Connor doesn't give us enough of a basis for deep sympathy for him. She just hints at it. And where it really matters is not with Shepard and his trauma. I have some sympathy for that. But I have a lot more sympathy for Norton and his trauma. There will be other moments in the novel where we hear about Norton's mother, and Norton is fixated on his mother. Shepard, as a good scientific positivist, tells him that his mother is dead and that she only lives in the memories we have of her. Rufus Johnson will tell Norton that if his mother was a good woman, she's gone to heaven, but if she was a bad woman, she's gone to hell. And Norton, of course, she's good, she was good, she was good. But Norton is living without his mother, and with his mother died not only her care for him, but also any care that Shepard might have had for him. Her bedroom is a shrine, and Johnson will go into her bedroom, which still has her old things in it, her hairbrushes and things like that, and he'll screw around and mess around, and Norton will be furious, because that's the violation of a sacred space for him. We're told that Shepard doesn't sleep in that room, which is maybe indicative of the fact that there is an aura about it for him also, although it's an unrecognized one. Shepard's bedroom, we're told, is purely sort of Spartan, like a military... Um, barracks with just a simple bed and some work equipment piled in the corner. But Shepard has moved out of the of that domestic family intimate erotic space of his wife's bedroom and into this cell where his life is bare and bleak and str and stark. And of course he's done that because there's pain there that he can't stand to confront. That's his luxury if he is not a parent. Then, doesn't seem very healthy to me, 
But if you want to not look at the pain involved in that loss, that's your prerogative. But he has a child, and he doesn't have that prerogative. But instead of helping his son with the grief of the mother's loss, he judges his son and despises him as unfit, as immoral, and as little better than an animal. And so, Shepherd is going to secure some kind of secular salvation for himself by being the man who mentored the brilliant Rufus Johnson and doesn't really believe there's anything he can do for his own son. So at this point, he demands Norton listen to him, and he tells him about how he's given Johnson a key to the home. Again, that's you know, there there might be circumstances in which a social worker might do that that would be highly admirable, but this isn't just a shepherd's home, this is Norton's home also, that he's now laid open to Johnson. They're both going to suffer for it. And he says he did it to show Johnson his confidence in him. He, as we've seen, has no confidence in Norton. Norton just gets to hear about um, how he feels confidence in Johnson and how he wants him to feel welcome. Be careful who you let into your house. Count the cost. Johnson also is not welcome for his own sake, we will come to see, but because he represents a kind of project for Shepard. And so Johnson realizes right away that Shepard doesn't really care about him, but cares about appearing a certain way in his own eyes. But at the time being, Shepard is high on himself, and so he thinks Johnson will come here because he's seen me and he's hungry. The characters, um, Johnson is hungry just as Norton is hungry. What are they going to be fed? What does this shepherd have to feed his sheep? And he says, if he doesn't use it, the key, I'm going out to find him and bring him here. I can't see a child eating out of garbage cans. Well, that's an admirable statement. Who's going to disagree with that? But Norton, as we've seen, is eating garbage too, within the walls of the family home. What does Shepard have to feed Johnson? Who is he to think he can give Johnson sustenance when his child is eating stale cake with peanut butter and ketchup poured on to soften it up? Norton is bothered by this, and Shepard regards that contemptuously, that it's just his selfishness, as if any child wouldn't be bothered by the idea that an older boy from the streets could just wander in at any time. And so, pointedly, we're told, Shepard's mouth stretched in disgust. He doesn't say to his child, well, I think this is the right thing to do, and I want you to get to know Rufus. Can we talk about what that would mean? He's just disgusted with the fact that Norton appears threatened. He gives us now this little bit of background about how Nor um, Johnson's father died, his mother is in the state pen, and his grandfather was this horrible old man who raised him in poverty and abuse. And um, Shepard says another killer line, how would you like to belong to a family like that? And Johnson says, or uh, Norton says, I don't know. And that I don't know is taken by Shepard as evidence of his failure of imagination and his selfishness that he can't be bothered to think about it. The fact we will come to see that the idea that Johnson's mother might be in the penitentiary is not the least appealing thing Norton has ever heard, because his mother is dead. And all he wants to do is to believe that he could see his mother again. And so that detail might not mean for Norton what Shepard assumes it does. But also, the family he belongs to now, um, Shepard says, how would you like to belong to a family like that? Well, how good does he have it? And that, of course, is the question I've been embroidering the whole time here that we've been talking about this. But it comes into focus there. Johnson's family is not ideal, but its failures are simply different kinds of failures than the ones Norton is living with. And so with great condescension, Shepard says, well, you might think about it sometime. And that's where we ended our passage, that snarky remark. 
How would you like to belong to a family like that? I don't know, the child said lamely. Well, you might think about it sometime, Shepard said. Shepard himself hasn't done very much thinking about that topic and the topic of family too broadly. He's going to give it a little bit of thought later in the story, but it will be far too late, unfortunately. So, We've seen here from our little walk through that passage that we've got this emphasis on the theme of consumption, of what we take into ourselves. And O'Connor is brilliant about having a single kind of dominating motif inform a whole story. In her famous story, Good Country People, the emphasis there is on the theme of sight and seeing, and all kinds of language and all kinds of emphases that have to do with sight come up over and over again, and key to them is the pair of glasses owned by the protagonist of the story, who's a sort of tragic but very arrogant young woman who thinks she's smarter than anybody else. And at the end of the story, she will lose her glasses. They will be stolen from her along with something else. And it's a little bit like the Earl of Gloucester in King Lear, who only begins to see in the sense of understanding after he loses his ability to see. The same thing happens with her. O'Connor says of her at one point before that happened, when she's in her arrogance and her you know, belief that she's the only one who recognizes the truth, O'Connor says of her that she looked like someone who had attained blindness by an act of will and meant to keep it. She had attained blindness by an act of will and meant to keep it. And so sight runs all through that story. In this story, we have the emphasis on the motif of food and consumption and what we take into ourselves. A little while after the passage we just read, Norton will vomit up his breakfast. No surprise, it's probably the best for him. Shepard believes he vomits up his breakfast because he can't handle the idea emotionally of sharing his life with Rufus Johnson. And of course, there is a kind of traumatic anxiety that's going to come from that for a 10-year-old boy that, as I suggested, is not his fault and is quite reasonable. But we also know damn well that he vomits up his breakfast because that's all that that breakfast is good for, because it's disgusting, because he hasn't been given good food. And so he throws it up. And Shepard thinks of him that he has so much to eat that he throws it up. But of course, it's because he has such lousy food eaten in a meal that is no meal in the family sense that he throws it up. Shepard himself is no better. A little while after our passage, I think it's after he cleans up after Norton, sort of begrudgingly, we're told he went back to the bar, again, the bar not even the counter, the bar, to finish his breakfast. The cereal was soggy in the cardboard box, but he paid no attention to what he was eating. He consumes food mechanically, and what he consumes is not wholesome or sustaining. Norton doesn't have wholesome food either, and that's not his fault, but Shepard's. Shepard is empty of anything good, with all his pretensions and all his high-mindedness. Johnson will say of him at one point, you know, it's, it's so sad because Johnson is so scathing towards Shepard, and Norton, who never gets a kind word for him, tries awkwardly at, one, at a couple of points to defend his father and say he's a good man. And Johnson says, yakety, yakety, yak. That's his imitation of Shepard. Yakety, yakety, yak, and he never says a thing. Gas, gas. Well, Johnson's on to something there. Shepard is empty, and he's only filled with gas, not with substance. It's only at the tragic, at, at the cusp of the tragic, the more than tragic end of the story that Shepard begins to see, and there's the devastating realization he tells a police officer who's arrested Johnson he, um, and, and who is skeptical, has been skeptical at other points of Shepard's good works. And he tells the police officer, I have nothing to reproach myself with. I did more for him than for my own child. Which is true. He wasn't buying telescopes and microscopes for Norton. And when Shepard says that phrase to himself, the arrow finally hits him. And you talk about the conscience being pierced. It finally is pierced at that point. 
and he realizes, he repeats the phrase to himself a little later, I did more for him than my own child. And then he starts to see Norton in a new light, although I'm sorry to say it will be too late. At this point, we are told, the narrator says of Shepard, that he had stuffed his own emptiness with good works like a glutton. He had ignored his own child to feed his vision of himself. So twice there in that short little pair of sentences, we have that language of food again, as Norton realizes that he's been stuffing himself with gas, with vanity, with his own good works, which are not done because they are good in and of the, not done for the goodness, not done for the sake of their goodness, and not but done because of love and care for Johnson, than because it's a kind of narcotic for Shepard, I think, and for his own pain. And so he now sees that he has ignored Norton, not on behalf even of Johnson, which would be bad enough, but on behalf of himself. Just as Mrs. Jellyby ignores her own children in order to serve the cause of these Africans 3,000 miles away, but is really serving her own cause and burnishing her own self-image. That's what Shepard has been doing. In contrast to Shepard, we only have the wild animal savagery of Johnson. Johnson, as I said, is not a figure we should trust. He's a trickster figure. He's a testing figure. His role is not to represent and to articulate a vision of the good, but to act as a kind of corrosive against Shepard's false ideal. Rufus believes in God, but he also believes he's damned. He tells Norton that if he repents before he dies, he will be saved, but he doesn't know if he's going to repent because, as he says, Satan has me in his power. So he's a little bit akin to the Satan we see in the book of Job who comes to test, you know, someone who is sort of paradoxically used by God against his own purposes. And so he represents an indictment of Shepard's selfish do-goodism. At one point, as I said, Norton will say to Johnson, um, defending this father who never defends him, he says to Johnson, he's good, because that's what he's been taught. Shepard has taught Norton that he's good. And Johnson says it's devastating. He says, I don't care if he's good, he ain't right. What does that mean? You can use those two words as, as synonyms, good and right. But what Johnson is doing is drawing a division between the act, the work of goodness, and the motivation. And he says later of Shepard that he don't know his left hand from his right. And that's a reference to the book of Jonah. I think it's the Ninevites who were told don't know their left hand from their right. Shepard, as we saw in the opening passage where he mocks Johnson's Bible, despises Rufus's supposedly simplistic faith, this credulous imbecility of Rufus and his grandfather, um, he has his own version of this. Shepard's faith does not involve going to heaven when you die. It involves the fact, you know, as a good mid-century positivist, he believes that one day there will be colonies on the moon. And he buys Johnson this telescope and tries to fill his head with ideas that one day you'll go to the moon and we'll all live on the moon. It's the, it's the empty promises of the 1950s that we'd all be taking our personal spacecraft to the moon and beyond at this point in the, 20, in the 21st century, that you know, by the year 2000, we'll all have our jetpacks. O'Connor isn't critiquing the idea of science here, but she is, in, she is critiquing the idea of a simplistic faith in science as the ultimate solution for our ultimate problems. And so Shepard has his own credulous faith in human perfectibility, in technology, and most of all in his own goodness. As Johnson says, he thinks he's Jesus Christ. And Johnson rejects this and it demands on shoving the Bible in Shepard's face, not, I think, so much out of pure delight in the Bible, but because he knows Shepard hates it, and it can bother him. And so you get that great moment in the passage we began with, where Johnson refuses to relinquish the Bible, Shepard mocks him for it, Johnson is not phased by the mockery, and instead tears pages of the Bible out and eats them. 
which is the kind of thing that a dysfunctional, delinquent 14-year-old might do to bother someone. But Johnson knows his Bible pretty well. He is intelligent, and he, re- um, he knows the passage in Ezekiel chapter 3, where God summons the prophet in a vision and gives him a scroll which represents the Word of God, and in the vision he tells Ezekiel to eat it, and so Ezekiel takes the scroll and eats it. And in the King James Version, it says, Then I did eat it, and it it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So the Word of God, when you take it into yourself, is sweet. And Johnson says that. He eats these pages of the Bible and gags them down and says, I've eaten it like Ezekiel, and I don't want none of your food after it. So this has been a meal. Of course, food, food, food all through this story. This has been happening around the meal table, because now that Johnson's in the house, they're at least actually sitting around the damn table. But Johnson says, you know, Shepard says, why will he come here? He'll come here because he's hungry. And yes, Johnson eats plenty of Shepard's food, but he says, now I don't want your food, meaning not simply what's in your refrigerator, but what it is you're trying to give me. I don't want it. I've rather eaten the word like Ezekiel. And as he says, it tastes sweet to him. It's like honey on the honey in the mouth, Ezekiel says. Johnson, I think this is far less a prophetic moment. I don't think Johnson is an Ezekiel figure. I think Johnson is a provocateur and a trickster. And this is about him offering a contrary narrative to Shepherds rather than him really meaningfully living through that narrative. But anyway, there it is. So We've seen the way in which O'Connor has gripped us from the very beginning with this idea of food and has not let up on it for the two pages that we read and doesn't let up on it really at any point in what follows. So it's a deeply sad and disturbing portrait of this wounded family and this father's failure to even remotely be a father or a shepherd. To these boys. I will leave it to you to read the story if you're brave enough and to see how it all falls out in the end. But um, I think at this point I will say farewell for now. On behalf of Eric Williams, this is David Anderson. Thank you for listening. <laughs>